Hey guys, welcome to Jerry's Live. As always, I'm your host, Amy Gardner-Dean, and we've got both platforms on and ready to go. Today's show is JL138. It's the top 10 mistakes that oil painters make. I've done them, you've done them. As long as you've picked up an oil brush, I guarantee that you've probably been guilty of at least one of these at some point, probably more. So we're not gonna point fingers or name any names, but we are going to go through this. So um, very quickly before we get started, because this is gonna be, since it's 10 things we're talking about, we're gonna be flying through it. And I'm going to apologize that you may need to go back and watch stuff because we're not gonna keep um, kind of just waiting around or going back and covering things that we've already gone over. It, it's going to be quite action packed. So um, we are doing this not necessarily in a order that I decided the order we were gonna go in is, okay, so you've got your stuff laid out and you're getting ready to work, okay? Um, one of the biggest mistakes that I think painters make, and, and it goes for multiple things, but oil especially, is your substrates. Substrate is the surface that you're painting on. And the mistake that's made by a lot of people is not knowing enough about that actual substrate. I on, on Jerry's Live, on having worked in customer service, I've heard so many people over the years talk about buying perfectly good canvases and then adding gesso to it for some reason, of, of which I don't know. And I know so many people are very heavy handed. If you're painting in oils and you're adding more acrylic resin on top of something that's already primed to perfectly accept that oil medium, you are doing yourself a disservice and you're doing your paint a disservice because as we talk about other mistakes that you make, that can add to the melee. So something that's important to learn about is your, are your substrate types. Now there's, you know, there's things anywhere from just painting boards. Boards is just means a stiff surface. Make sure that you investigate what that board is. What is the core made out of? Is it something that's going to be archival and durable? Long ago, those hand turned panels were only put on a cardboard, a really thick cardboard backing um, that was not archival and that over the years will kind of leach acid out and damage your painting. So anytime you're working on a board surface, a panel surface, learn more about it. How is it primed? Is it primed? What is the core made out of? What is the fabric that's wrapped around it? Is it primed? Even how many times is that primed? A good way to tell if it's something that's gonna be quality for you painting in oils is price. If it's too good to be true, it's probably not professional. And, and that goes with canvases and things like that too. Um, a regular just canvas, like this is a, a Creative Mark Edge and I know our Paramount surfaces feels slightly dry to the touch and that makes people want to suddenly just grab gesso and kind of knock themselves out with that. That's not what you need to do. You want that little bit of surface texture to be there to grab your lower levels of oil paint so that you can have a good bond to the surface. Uh, especially if you're one of those people that likes to really thin your first layers down. If it's more absorbent, it's gonna grab on. If you've got a lot of resin in a primer sitting on top of that, that is not gonna be your friend and that can actually make your painting delaminate over time. So that's something you want to be aware of. Um, materials like linen, if you're gonna paint large with a lot of weight and add things uh, that can tend to you know, weigh your oil painting down like a lot of painting butter or cold wax or things like that, linen is a much more durable long-term solution for large scale paintings because it's a very durable uh, fabric that resists mold and mildew and it doesn't flex and go slack like cotton where cotton will tend to um, stretch. You know, you, you all know you put get your favorite cotton shirt in the dryer, you pull it out, it's like eh, and then after a little while you're like, oh, it's comfortable again. Think of canvas doing that with weight. It's going to have that effect on something large scale. So linen, it might be what you're going to need to do if you paint large scale and you've had that problem and didn't know about it. Then priming plays a big deal. You've got your acrylic primer. Oil priming is that beautiful surface that because it's an oil to oil base, 
paint sits on top of the surface rather than absorbing in. It's much more kind of refractive and reflective immediately of that oil. A lot of paintings then are done on, I, I, I've been places before where I've been able to determine somebody's using an oil prime canvas, not because I went and smelled it, Katie, which you know that that's how we tell around here. I can tell different brands by the oil priming smell. It's that that paint is that much more luminant, right? It, and and, some, and even, even with really high quality paints, I can still tell the difference between an acrylic primed painting and an oil primed painting because I've painted on both. And so I know those little differences and nuances. So that's something to consider is your substrate. Should've gotten you an egg timer, so every five minutes, ding, ding. next. Um, so next thing we're, we're going to talk about, we've got your substrate. It's the perfect, perfect, uh, you know, priming for what you're gonna do. You're gonna get ready to paint here. So let's talk about paint. Painting components. I can guarantee you at least 50% of you probably don't know what oil base all of your oil paints are that you've bought. At least 50%. What does that mean? Drying oils are the oil that's ground in with your pigment. Your pigment is ground and that oil is, you know, mixed it up. They talk about triple milling. That's just making sure that pigment has been worked in and worked in and worked into the oil to provide a really smooth, very even base. Linseed oil, there's sunflower oil, there's safflower oil, there's walnut oil, there's poppy oil. All of those are drying oils. They all perform very differently in painting. They all have different drying rates and they all have different flexibility in the paint film long term. Okay, so you've got that, and if you combine that with pigments, which we're going to talk about, that can do really awesome things for you. It can do really not so awesome things with you if you're not educated about how those components work together. So just so people kind of understand what the difference is. Okay, so here's a Daniel Smith tube. I just went over there and grabbed multiple tubes of paint. Linseed oil. Williamsburg, their cobalt blue is linseed oil. Michael Harding's ivory black is linseed oil, but not all of his paints are. It depends on the pigment. He will put, uh, put clear drying oils like, like um, poppy and like safflower oils in some light colors, um, and then the linseed in darker colors. The reason linseed oil is in ivory black is ivory black takes forever to dry. It's kind of like titanium white. Linseed oil dries the absolute fastest of all the drying oils, and it's the most flexible film, okay? So it just tends to yellow sometimes over time, especially if you're gonna store paintings in a closet out of the light of day. So you don't have to worry about yellowing with ivory black because you're not gonna be able to see it, right? It's not a white where that can maybe show long-term. So you want this to dry as fast as possible. So you're not waiting on this to take forever to dry when you've got the rest of the painting that's further along and you need to add on top of it, but this still is not dry enough. Lucas 1862, they have a very creative approach to this. They've got linseed oil for the kind of durability and the faster drying, but they use sunflower oil because it's a paler drying oil and it gives a little bit of body to it along with something that they add, which is um, beeswax, a little bit of beeswax. So it, it kind of does something to the paste, makes it creamier. That's just a combination that works for them in kind of how their formula is and how they approach that painting. So those are gonna dry quicker because of those attributes. Um, the Gamblin Warm White, the Yellow Ochre in Windsor Newton, both safflower oil. Safflower oil does not take as long as poppy seed uh, oil does, but it's not as fast drying as linseed. It's supposed to be non-yellowing. All right, uh, the May Mary Puro safflower oil, sometimes they use poppy seed oil. Charvin, the Extra Fines poppy seed oil. M. Graham, always walnut oil. It's just what they prefer. That was like kind of the old, almost most original oil that they used to do oil paints with. Um, if it's not good quality walnut oil, you can have problems with it going rancid, but 
they use very pure, very cold pressed oil. So, and then even like Sennelier, safflower oil. Um, only, I thought it was that across the board, I started looking at this little container, the yellow, safflower, the black, wanna take a guess? Linseed, why? Again, they know that ivory black takes forever to dry. So they have done what they can to try to make it so their performance is more equal across all of their paints. Okay, so those are things that you need to question. If you work really quickly, you do a lot of commission work, it needs to go out the door. You don't wanna work with alkyd mediums because you don't like how stinky they are and all that. You're probably gonna need to work with linseed-based paints, right? You're gonna need to add linseed oil-based mediums in to get them to dry faster. If you are doing portraits or things like that and things can sit a while, you need the time to be kind of open and extended so you can do all these beautiful glazings, then you're gonna to wanna to use something that's poppy seed. Then you're gonna to wanna to use something that's more safflower oil-based. If you work in a lot of light colors, especially with portraiture, you don't want them yellowing. So those are gonna be the types of brands of paint looking at those drying oils. And it's always labeled on the tube itself, either on the back or on the side. Just to say, just to clarify, you're not saying don't mix them, just be aware of what you have. No, no, it's, all oil paint can be intermixed. The issue is if you're putting something with poppy seed oil with something that's a very quick drying, you're going to have just suddenly altered that dry time, right? So you need to be aware of that. Why is this part of my painting not drying? Why is it, why is this part really dry? This part is really taking forever and this part in the middle is kind of almost there. That's the only, this is giving you the education to understand why that's happening to you, okay? That's a, thank you for interjecting that. That makes sense. All right, so further about paint, the, the next thing, most people have no clue what the pigments are in their paint. Don't you think that's a pretty fair assessment? Yeah. Um, even even in college, we didn't discuss that. Uh, you know, we discussed the colors, the trade name colors, or, you know, cobalt blue is cobalt blue, right? We found out from a show that we did, which at the top of your description, always, Facebook and YouTube, there is, if you, if it, you hit the show more, it shows you the whole description. There's always two links there. One is all of our shows in chronological form from start to finish. The other is in by topic, okay? We did a show that was based purely on pigments in paint. We went through oil paint, acrylic paint, and watercolor. And we talked about colors that we did, cobalt blue and oil, uh, what, uh, magenta in um, acrylic, Katie, and then like- Lemon yellow. Lemon yes, yellow. lemon yellow in watercolor which is like, that was the Pandora's box of a color name that was like 20 different pigments. Um, so you need to be aware, especially if, oh my gosh, this particular, you know, this cobalt blue is out in this thing or cobalt blue hue or whatever, what brand can I replace it with because I've got to get this painting done. You need to look at that pigment number on the side. Or somebody discontinue something. Yes on the side or the back of your of your tube and i did not bring my reading glasses in here so it's going to be where i can one that i can actually see pbk 9 is ivory black okay so it will be like pg pigment green right pr pigment red you need to be aware of those now there's a website that's www.artiscreation.com that you can go buy the color itself, click on that number that you see on your paint tube. It's going to tell you what that pigment is or if you've got multiple pigments in a tube, how fast the drying rate is, if it's oils. It will give you brand names, like if, if it's something like the lemon yellow, what different brands use that particular pigment and what the trade names are that they call it. Because something that might be called lemon yellow in one, might be called something completely different in another. So that's a good way for you to familiarize yourself with the pigments that you've got. Also, the other thing it will do, it will tell you if they're a brittle pigment or not. Okay, 
things like zinc white. There's been all that controversy with zinc white, zinc white bad. Blah, blah, blah. Zinc is a very brittle pigment and the more you use it with a slow drying oil that's brittle, like if you had zinc and poppy oil, you can have issues with things cracking, all right? Because it's just a pigment that just for some reason dries like a shell. So with things like that, you might want to look for it in a more flexible oil form if you just really need to have that pigment. So we'll give you all that information on that website to help you become more familiar with your paints. Now, so I put a thing on here, find the grind, so I would know what, what to explain that is about. Every pigment is ground very specifically for optimum color refraction for that pigment, okay? If you take everything that you've got and you just grind it down to this powdery substance, it might do something like eyeshadow, but it's not going to give you the ideal refraction for something to give it that most beautiful, rich color. I remember in customer service one time, a customer bought a gigantic tube of Michael Harding lapis lazuli and sent it back. Well, first they said that it was defective and I guess another one got sent. We, they sent it back. There was nothing defective about it. She just never used real lapis lazuli. It's a very large particle pigment that to give it that brightest blue that that's kind of hallmark color. If you grind that down further, it's going to look very dull and it's not going to work well in an oil painting. But because she never used the real thing probably or used it from another brand that did just grind it down so much, she didn't know that it was a grittier texture, a larger pigment particle. It's like if you use earth tones, you know you've got, they've got a different feel. They're a little bit grittier, right? As opposed to something like a Hansa yellow or something like that that's got a much finer pigment particle, okay? So that's something that, just like um, cars, can a mechanic work on a Maserati versus a Ford? Yes. Is there an art to making the Maserati versus a Ford? Probably yes, or a race car or something like that. So higher end paints have those artistic mechanics that know the ins and outs of pigment as a form and it's in and of itself that are going to make things to that specification of what that pigment needs to be most beautifully used, okay? Um, we talked about dry times. I think we're ready to go to the next one. How are we doing on time? The first three. Okay. All right. Brushes. We all have brushes. We might not have known when we were buying them. Everybody always asks, uh, what oil painting brushes do I need? What, what type of work are you going to do? Are you going to do portraiture where it needs to be super smooth and enamel-like? Are you doing uh, Monet-style landscapes where a really nice, stiff, like a hog bristle brush is going to give you kind of those nice textural kind of, you know, dots in the trees and the highlights and things like that? Um, are you going to work large where you need something like this? I've seen people literally buy brushes like this that they're going to be painting like a 48 by 56 or something with, I guess, brush hair at a time. Think about the size that you're going to paint. You need these if you're doing murals and things like that. If you're doing, you know, little tiny, you know, miniatures that are just these teeny tiny things, you're going to need more like the two hair brushes, right? Um, so, so consider that. Then educate yourself on hair. And we did a brush episode, a long um, handled like oil and acrylic brush episode. And that's in that list of, of all these, you know, what, 148 shows uh, that, that talks about that. But we're going to very quickly break that down. Stiff brushes for like doing your underpainting and things like that. Hog bristle, uh, hog uh, bristles with synthetics. Uh, especially if you're a really rough painter, that will help with some wear and tear. Um, a nice mid-level mid kind of workhorse brush would be something like um, the Hamburg brushes that have kind of the old mongoose hair texture. You can't get mongoose hair anymore, but it's got some natural soft hairs and then some really... Um, advanced synthetics with multiple filaments in it 
that paint just like that hog or the um, mongoose hair used to that was kind of that beautiful in between style hair that would still handle heavy loads but you could do some glazing with um, and came up with a very effective actually better brush than the original mongoose hair to me I think it can control heavier loads but hold more fluid for doing glazing so that's a good in-between brush kind of hair you've got softer things um, like a fitch style hair I'm gonna put these up here Katie um, a fitch style hair which is that dark one super soft and buttery even softer than that is actually a Kalinsky sable super soft natural sable hair um, and then if you need, you know, you prefer an animal friendly choice, you've got things like the synthetic Kalinskis that have still that nice soft hair, beautiful glazing um, and control that a sable would give you, but with the animal friendly effect. Okay, long hair brushes are what you need if you're going to be easel painting. If you're somebody who um, sits with your work flat at a table, obviously short handle brushes are going to give you the better control. But the reason that they put these long handles on this is because you need to be far back from your work. Um, I always tell students when I do workshops, get up and walk away from your work. Get up and walk away from your work because I'll see them over there, two hair brushing it with this little tiny area. They get up and walk away and suddenly you can see all the problems that you have going on that had you just been standing back from your painting more where you step back a foot, come back, oh, I need to correct that, step back a little, correct. It makes the biggest difference in the world. So there's a method to the madness of they just didn't want to sell more wood for a handle. There's, it's designed for a reason and it's designed to be balanced like that. Um, so then you've got things like bristle shape and I think probably the Hamburg are the easiest to show this on. Um, not everybody knows what, what types of hair are good for, or what types of shape are good for specific things. There we go. Okay, so that is a flat. Flat means that the hair is longer than the brush is wide. See how nice and long that is? That's good for a nice pull down stroke. It holds more paint than a bright does. Uh, you can turn it on edge when it's wet and actually get some line work with it. Uh, but it's a good all purpose brush for putting down larger areas of paint. All right, a bright by difference, see how that's almost pretty much as tall as it is wide, right? Sorry, it takes the camera a minute to adjust. That obviously is going to give you a little bit tighter control in a, in a smaller area, um, better for like little short strokes. You don't want to use it like you do that, that longer flat because the paint can actually work up in the um, into the ferrule itself. So that by difference, I mean that's that's a huge difference between the two, right? Flat on the left, bright on the right. Then you've got rounds. Rounds are your typical, you know, point that's going to give you where you can dot little dots in. You can kind of pull a small stroke down, um, unless they're a super tight sable. Uh, like a Kalinsky sable, you're not going to get like precision control with a point. These are more for kind of placing dots of paint, uh, especially if you're talking about a round that's more in like a hog bristle style uh, brush. That's going to give you some nice kind of points of paint, but not going to be for great detail. Then you've got filberts. Filberts are probably what I use the most for everything. See, it's got that kind of curved cup, almost like an almond. Um, you can turn them on edge and use them as a straight edge. Uh, you can use them for a pulling stroke. You can scrub with them. Um, I tend to scrub a little on each side and then kind of it, it evens it out and just kind of shortens it up. Um, to me, best all, if, if somebody said you can't have but one brush, it would be a filbert. Fan. Fans are ideal for softening and blending edges. Um, like if you've got a sky, if you've got a portrait that you need to kind of soften uh, the skin colors in, that's the perfect brush for that. It's not, it's, that's all this is really designed to do. This is because by nature of how that's put together, it's not gonna hold heavy weights of paint and it's not going to be absorbent enough to really do glaze work. It's just more for 
kind of that easy softening. Okay. <coughs> All right. So uh, let's go to underpaintings. You got your paint, you know your pigments, your drying time, you've got your substrate, you've got your brushes. Now we are going to underpainting. The, I think, absolute biggest thing I see people do wrong, no matter where I go and how I was trained. So I'm gonna say, my name is Amy. I was taught how to underpaint wrong because it's true, is they thin their paint paste down like it's a watercolor wash with mineral spirits. And then they slap it around and you've got it splishing and splashing, which the mess isn't the problem. Be exuberant, you're painting. You, sh you should, you know, enjoy that and own that. The problem is you're taking a petroleum-based product and you are using it to thin paint paste down and break down those kind of molecular bonds of that oil that are what knit together when it oxidizes and dries to give you that strength in a paint film. And you're kind of throwing all that away and putting it in with something kind of oily and, and messy feeling and thinning it down where you can take it once it's dry and actually wipe it off if you've done it too thin. So if you could do that, what are you going to do and what's going to happen when you've built this beautiful painting on top of, if you've, of, of you know, this kind of, it, it would be like building stairs and not, you know, tamping the ground down or building a house and not tamping the ground down for your foundation, right? Just kind of putting some rocks down and going from there. And I don't know why the house is doing this. Same kind of a deal. So you do not want to do that. Okay. The only time that that really kind of works is with those super dry acrylic canvases that we talked about at first because they're absorbent enough where they pull enough of it in where then that's really kind of not counting as a first layer. The next layers are what adhere to it. Um, so what do you need to do to have that not happen? Because the problem is most people want it to be very quick. They want it to dry very fast so they can immediately start painting. It's okay to start painting. You can always put a ground on uh, and thin it down slightly where it makes that paint paste smooth enough if you really want to use those mineral spirits where it can be applied but you're not thinning it down ridiculously. Use earth tones for your first layers because earth tones are the fastest drying pigments that there are. It's why you always see the burnt sienna and burnt umber uh, grounds for the most part if people are working quickly. You can use things like spike lavender oil instead because that actually thins some and bites into the surface instead of just kind of sitting there in kind of this, this messy weird stuff. And with one of the varnishing episodes we did, we actually took one of my college paintings that was done on a panel, that was done on acrylic gesso, that was done with a super thin washy wash of mineral spirits, and we went <laughs> and took the color right off and that painting had been varnished. Okay, so I cannot stress to you more, and it's a painting I love, it can't go anywhere because that's what it's like, but I can't stress to you more the importance of a very solid foundation. Paint paste is thick paste. Toothpaste is effective because it's big and then you put it on, right? Nice and thick. The paint needs to be the same thing. Thin it down enough where it's brushable and then use it to start your painting out. All right. Um, the other thing that people use, where do we go? But it's natural. But it says it's natural. So that's going to be healthier for me, right? And then they're using this. This is only a brush cleaner, folks. Brush clean. There, sh there needs to be like a little art skull and crossbones. No. The paintbrushes like this because this if this gets in there and it's a citrus base in your paint besides it just being slippery and not wanting to adhere your paint is going to be destroyed over time because this is not a painting additive right this is only a brush cleaner if you think about these types of things as brush cleaners only or just mildly thinning the the paint paste you will do better but this Never, ever, ever, ever use 
to add to your paints to paint with, okay? Did I say again, don't add this to your paints to paint with? Because I'm just, I really want you to know that well, that much. Re retain that. Amy says no. No. But it's natural. Okay, fat over lean is the next thing. And, and this is a very confusing concept because it's, it's just, it sounds weird. It's a confusing concept. A lot of people don't understand the fat over lean concept. Um, what does it mean in practical terms if it's not done right? Well, we've talked about different oils have different dry times, right? Different pigments have different dry times. Then you're adding something on to it like, but this is just a painting medium. Well, you don't know this is a, a Turner painting medium. How much oil is in this? How much solvent's in this? What's the dry rate? If you add a whole lot to the bottom layers and less to the top layers, is that gonna be fat over lean? Well, maybe, but if you don't know what's in it and don't investigate that for you, and I hate to make it, you like feel like you're gonna have to learn stuff, but you're gonna have to learn stuff. Okay, I know. Katie was like, what, learning stuff? You need to know what's in those materials to know if you are doing yourself the service of making this painting archival, okay? So if you just add oil, that's fat, right? If you just have solvent, those are the two extremes, right? The more oil you add, the fatter that's getting to your paint, okay? So if a medium is lean it's got more solvent less oil if it's fat it's got more fat which is the oil less solvent the solvents in there to break down the fat to make it more liquid so it can be added on right and make the dry time faster otherwise you could just use regular linseed oil and paint on the painting and that thins your paste that makes it enamel like and strong but that's like just straight up fat right so kind of the beauty of the Chelsea products to me, if this is something that makes your just brain want to explode, you're just going to have one of those spontaneously combust moments. There's a lean medium and there's a fat medium. You use the lean for your underpainting. You use the fat as you're getting further and further up. Then as you're finishing it off, you just use straight oil. Okay. Obviously, faster dry time, lean, fat, slower dry time, then straight up oil added to it, even slower. All right? I'm getting a lot of like, what about galkid, what about liquid? Okay, so those are things that are really better to, uh, to start working with. If you start with any alkyd medium, you better stay with it. Don't add any of this other stuff. Okay, that's a mineral spirits and resin based medium it's one of those things that it dries fast enough it's very flexible and stuff like that you don't need to worry about it being fat over lean because it's kind of taken that equation out of your head where you don't have to deal with it what you do have to deal with though is if if you've got respiratory issues it's going to potentially bother you right and then there's still you can only add so much if you start adding so much especially if it's in like a paste form like a painting butter you have to follow those percentages from the manufacturer and you really need to find those out and adhere to that rule because pushing it can cause some really crazy things with your paint, okay? And also, those are pretty modern. They don't necessarily know long-term what those are going to do as far as with the oils, they know what is gonna yellow and what's not because guess what? That's what they've done for forever. So that would just be something where I urge you to use them sparingly and with caution and always stick with them. Don't, don't cross kind of those blurry lines of, of medium. Stick with all alkyds or stick with just the regular oils. Okay. So it's, it's just because it's a completely different animal, the fat over lean is not as applicable, but you need to do your due diligence and learn, do some reading about it from not just people that say I'm an instructor, because guess what? My bird could say she's an instructor. As long as she's talked to one person and they believe they were being taught by her, you know, I, I, I 
Always make sure it's respectable sources. Always make sure it's people that have a lot of experience doing what they do, okay? All right. Real quick before you move on. Yes. Um, Brandon was asking, she's not quite sure what you meant by the, find out the percentages. She's saying you just mix it with paint enough that it's going to spread with your brush, correct? Or do you need to find out more specific for each one? Okay, so percentages means if you're using the, like, so let's say lean medium, right? Or just any, any oil, okay? Let's just go with straight up linseed oil because I think that's probably the easiest. Oh, yeah. If you're using small bits of, like, more paint paste and just a little bit of oil, that's leaner than if you're really adding a lot more oil to that paint, right? Because you're increasing the fat content. There's already oil in it. But the more you add, the fatter it's going to get, okay? And the slower that dry time is gonna be. Does that make sense? And we've talked about this in other shows about mediums. Uh, we talked uh, about the alkyd mediums. Jimmy Leslie was on under Shows with Guests. And he's from, uh, the, from the collective that does Windsor Newton. He talked very specifically about their different mediums, about the liquid and alkyds, and gave us some really awesome, like, with tests with turning it on its side and watching it drip down and that fat over lean made a lot more sense didn't it katie because mm -hmm. it was actually kind of like a a visual for it okay so definitely go to those shows that again are linked at the top of the description hit see more it'll pull down there's two different links one is a document for chronological shows which if you want to look things up by topic is not going to help you that's just from start to finish uh you know jail one to now the other show is by topic and the one show is with jimmy leslie and it's under i think oil paints oil paint mediums and then under uh guest shows with guests okay all right so let's let's move on because we've got a whole bunch of other episodes and what it, what i will do is in our jerry's live group we've got a facebook group that if you have to have a facebook account to be on it's jerry's live go to the groups and search for it you have to answer the question when you ask to be in it and then they'll approve you. I will put in there tomorrow the link to all the shows that cover all of these 10 things that are mistakes oil painters make. And I'll cover all the shows that help give you additional information to that. Okay. All right. So we're going to um, move on. We already talked about the oil mediums and what they could do. We talked about the fat over lean. The next thing that a lot of artists struggle with are basic lacks of color theory fundamentals or values. Not saying you, you, you know, are shady and don't have values. I'm, I'm saying you don't understand the concept of values or you're not employing it in your paintings to get the most kind of interest in your work, the most kind of look and dynamic, the most contrast in your work. Okay. So first let's talk about values and their importance. If we've watched any of the shows where I'm painting, I'm telling you squint, 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 right? Even with drawing, you want to have your darkest darks and you want to have your lightest lights and you want there to be some differences in between because those contrasts are what can make a very blah work if there's not it with the exact same subject matter and just using the difference in those value contrasts it can make it very exciting and electric and very interesting these scales are ideal for anything they get these little cutouts it's not to you know peek through with your eye but it is there to hold over something to i'm going to go to this camera so if i've got my brush i can look and see what value those bristles are, right? The three, eight, sorry. Yes, squint. That's gonna match up right there the most, right? But what about the handle? The handle's gonna be, I mean, this is on cardboard, so it's not, but the handle's gonna be closest to the darkest value, right? If you squint, it's real close, kind of in between those. So it's kind of a 5% between these, all right? I know it's annoying. And it makes you look weird, but you don't care because you're an artist and you want to improve yourself. So this type of thing helps. It still applies to color because when you squint, you can see the values and not necessarily what the colors are. So this is an important thing 
too many people don't have. Even as long as I've been doing this, I know what the values are and I can usually even guess when I see them in somebody's painting, but I still have 900 of these everywhere. Tucked into my drawing area and my painting area, my pastel drawer, everything, there's these everywhere. Okay, so it's a very important tool to have, even though it's just a very inexpensive little piece of printed cardboard. All right, then color. We've already talked about this. We've did a whole bunch of different color theory episodes, which if you haven't seen, are excellent tools for helping you understand things better. Yellow and blue make green, right? Not necessarily. Okay. If you get lucky, okay? There are warm and cool yellows. Cool yellow means what? It's more of a greenish yellow. Warm yellow means what? More of that sunshiny yellow, that sunflowery yellow, right? So if I need to mix a green, I don't want to use that sunflowery yellow. The same with blue. If you have phthalo blue at home, you've ever noticed that it says GS or RS, green shade or red shade? So that's a cooler phthalo with that green, a warmer phthalo with that red. Use those to help you make color mixing decisions. If it doesn't have those for clues, just you're just gonna have to look at it and evaluate it. That's why we're gonna be doing the swatching episode because you know what the easiest way to see your paint out of the tube to know if it's more cool or more warm isn't in a mass tone because if it's dark, you might not be able to tell. It's to swatch them and do them at thinned areas to add a little white with them, add a little black with them. That gives you more information about your colors and then helps you mix better colors when you go to do that, okay? So that's a very important thing. You can change the mood of a painting by altering the temperature of it. So that helps you for like when you're going to mix colors, all right? Other things that are really helpful for that kind of thing, color mixing guide. This one, it just seemed kind of like I was not sure about it. It's a gray value scale in it. Has areas where you can mix your own personal palette so that it gives you the ideas so you don't have to do it on something else. Has all of this information on colors and mixing. It shows you warm colors. It shows you cool colors. It gives you an idea of complementaries, triadic harmonies, split complementaries, all the things we've talked about in our color theory shows in a little pocket sized thing. So if you don't know a lot about color theory, pocket sized cheat sheet, okay? If you really want something bigger, you can have something like the studio one that helps with color mixing with trade names. You can, uh, this color is beautiful. It's dioxazine violet or purple. And then now I've got to follow it down. Cobalt blue. There's some of these in here that you're like, oh, that's amazing. And then you're like, those colors make that? This is like a gigantic cheat sheet to pin to your wall in a studio. So if you're looking for a particular color, then with these, you can go, you know, add to make a shade, make it darker, make it lighter with some white. More information to help you save time, save effort, save paint, because Goodness knows, learning color mixing, you waste a lot of paint if you don't learn it the right way and have some tools to help you, okay? So, that's something to follow up on with some of our other shows, because that's a huge thing that can change from taking somebody who's very new or mediocre, who's not new, and giving them what looks like a whole lot of experience and a whole lot of matur maturity as an artist by really kind of attacking some color theory issues, playing with some color theory, using that and applying that in your work. Again, not the fun stuff to learn, but you need to learn it, okay? The other thing, and it's something I know we're all guilty of, and I can tell in my home studio when I go over and do this, brush hygiene or lack thereof. And I'm looking at some of you people I even know acrylic painters that I know. I know people that will buy some of the cheapest brushes because they know that um, they're not good about taking care of brushes, which that's great. 
investing in good brushes, you can actually save more money long term and washing them diligently. Okay. Um, with oil paints, acrylics can be really hard on brushes, but synthetics make it easier. With oil paints, you're upping the ante because you're using drying oils that are very acidic on brushes and then the chances are good that probably what you're using as a brush cleaner are going to be petroleum products like mineral spirits like gamsol like um terpenoid like terpenoid natural that you're only going to use to wash your brushes in or so help me i'll come to your studio and we're going to have a come to jesus meeting okay but once you get this in your brush mineral spirits and stuff you can wipe out the excess paint use the brush Again, after you've rinsed it in mineral spirits, this, you don't want to put that back in your paint paste, okay? So you're going to have to wash those brushes. So, anything that is a natural brush cleaner, and everybody's like, but I've used palmolive or ivory for years. Guess what? That's a bad idea. That is stripping it with natural hair brushes, which is what works to me or natural synthetic blend brushes works the best with oil paints because it's already got some oil to, in it, natural hair oils. So it's used to handling oils. It performs really well. You've got this acidic oil paint in it. You don't want to absolutely strip out any natural hair. Okay. Again, that's a petroleum product. You're look, look it up. If you didn't know that your dishwashing liquid is a petroleum product. You want something that's natural with like a, an oil base, a natural oil base. This is the little Chelsea studio soap, which I love. Everybody and their brother and their grandma and probably their great grandma, maybe if she wasn't too old, has used the master's cleaners. That's just the little cake in the, the tin. Stuff like the Jackson linseed oil soap, where it's kind of the same thing as the other soap, but more liquid. Okay. Oops, the lids. I'm not going to open this because the chances are good. I'll drop it. <laughs> okay, you're going to wet your brush, you're going to put it in there, work it into a paste, work it into your hand, you're going to see it coming up, you're going to see the color starting to come out, you're going to rinse it, then you're going to do it again, okay? If they're really gunky and dirty, or sometimes if you've been painting a lot, you might kind of keep your brushes there, and at the end of two or three days, you know that you're going to paint them, you've, you've you know, wipe them out really good. You've used mineral spirits, but you know, there's still that residue. It still feels weird. It still feels a little stiff. You're, you can put this type of soap in it. It's not going to hurt it. Let it sit overnight, even let it dry and it come back and wash it out. I've actually with, with when we first started carrying the jacks, we did because I took some ancient paint brushes. I was going to throw away, put it in it, let it dry after working it in two and three times not only was able to salvage the brushes, but they worked beautifully again. Okay. So these types of soaps, A, it's safe for your hands. So therefore it's probably safe for your brush. Perfect to use. That keeps a valuable brush valuable. It keeps a tool working and ready to go. And that is an important thing. Then if you buy a little more expensive brush, it's an investment that you can keep valuable because you've taken care of it, right? Brush hygiene. You don't wash your hair with dish soap. No, no. And, and, I mean, dishpan hands, everybody knows what dishpan hands are. You don't want dishpan brushes. <coughs> okay. All right. Then this is the thing that always trips everybody up because everybody wants it. And I understand the rage against the machine on this one, guys, because I've been there varnishing. You need to do it, number one. You need to be honest with yourself, number two, about when work is actually really totally oxidized and dry. I have had people that have wanted to argue with me up and down that as soon as it's dry to the touch, my painting is dry and I can put a DeMar varnish product on it. No, 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 for the life of God, no. Please don't, don't, I again, I will come to your house and we're going to have a discussion on this. You have got to let an oil painting oxidize long enough so it is completely dry because you will have cracking if it's thick at all. Okay, even if you're using the alkids, 
Okay, those have to off gas just because they're hard and you can push on them and they're not, you know, indenting doesn't mean it's still not off gassing. All right. What can you do up until the point that your painting is dry? And let's keep in mind, oil paints might take six year, six months to 18 months to fully dry. Thin paintings, again, are probably going to take at least six months to 18 months to fully oxidize. Okay? Hate to break it to you. That's one of the bad things about oils. What can you do in the meantime to protect them? There's a number of things you can do. Everybody may or may not know what retouch varnish is. Retouch varnish is like a DeMar varnish, but it's thin enough, it has more solvent in it, it's lean, okay, where it puts enough of a coat on the painting to protect it from environmental things like smoke or dust or pet hair, things that are in environments, okay, but it's still thin enough where the painting can oxidize through that painting. It needs to be fully dry to the touch to do that. You can paint it on, okay? You can spray it on. It has to be retouch varnish, okay? That means you, you're gonna have to do more to it. It has to be retouched, right? But at least it'll provide some protection for your painting for the time being. Now, the other varnishes, like, we're very, <laughs> solubars are our jam, yeah. right, Katie? Uh, the DeMar varnish, all those types of things are going to have to be done when the painting is fully dry, okay? With oils, and I've had people ask this before, and it's fine to ask because better safe than sorry, you do not need an isolation coat, okay? The oils, once they're dry, it's a very impervious film, so you don't need a barrier between your solvent and your paint, okay? But again, a reason not to thin your paint down too much because putting that varnish on has solvent in it and that can actually lift something up that was that's really thin that was not properly bonded to the substrate. But then there's this crazy new guy in town that Gamblin makes that's called Gamvar. Okay, it has to be a little further than dry to the touch. You're gonna have to eat and, and on Gamblin's website, what is it, gamblincolors.com? Mm -hmm. They've got a video for how to apply it. It's applied in a way that you would think of last for applying varnish and it's foolproof. So, which is a beautiful thing because varnish can be so painted on too thick or, or have problems or whatever. But this can be applied. They show, have a little video of dry to the touch where you're actually pushing your thumbnail against the thickest part of your painting. And as long as it doesn't push down, there's not that indentation. It's safe to put Gamvar on. Gamvar is not a retouch varnish. It's just been formulated to be thin enough where even if it's not been, you know, 18 months for a thicker painting, as long as there's not that give, it will protect it and work as a final varnish, okay? They actually developed this with the National Portrait Gallery. So it's not like okay. they were in their garage and were like, so hey, you want to make like a retouch varnish that's better? Hey, yeah, let's do that. Dude, you know, this is actually a real deal product, okay? So this may be your last bet for things, and they've got gloss, they've got satin, they've got matte for, for you know, those short attention span clients that you don't want to have to go back and put a final varnish on the painting because they're hard to deal with. I mean, or you're going to be selling your work somewhere where it may be at a show and it may be sold, walk off that night, you want your work to be protected so that it stays beautiful for forever. Karen was just asking about that and saying, how do you deal with the logistics of selling a piece when it comes to that? Do you wait to sell it? Do you sell it to them and then tell them to come back and varnish it? Do you do that? Do you that's, that's, why, that's why this product, I really think that's why this product was developed yeah. because they've got the corner market on it, right? Before, if it was something where it was somebody close by, um, and they needed it, you know, right away and it was, you know, dry to the touch, I would do retouch and then either come varnish it at their house if they were local or they could bring it back to me and I would varnish it for free. 
but that starts becoming crazy if you're shipping work to galleries and stuff. And that's the thing, if you're shipping work, you want it to be protected with some sort of varnish. Okay, which, so that may mean, and again, I know it's a pain in the butt. That's why there's different mediums that, you know, watercolor's great because you can send it out the door tomorrow. Bye-bye. Every medium has its drawbacks, you know, and this is un the unfortunate drawback of oil paint. It's just that, that dry time. But again, there's products like these that will help so you don't have to wait forever and a day. Now, I mean, if you like that super glossy, you know, DeMar varnish, that old, you know, Renaissance, old world glow, well, then you're just going to have to wait and, and you need to decide how to handle it if you've got a client. But, um, but this gives you a very, a very, you know, cutting corners means without cutting corners, I guess. Okay, so I think that's it in a nutshell. What questions do we have? This was a lot to cover, and I'm sorry, and I probably did more finger, finger shaking and threatening to come to people's houses. That's a new one. And now my throat is sore, so I'm gonna drink coffee I'm while we wait for it. All an hour. Oh, that's good. Again, if you missed it at the beginning, we're going to have an episode March 10th where we're going to be we, we talked about different paints. How do you learn about your paints? You swatch your paints. How do you learn about the performance of your paints? Um, we're going to send the first 500 people that sign up a uh, two free 20 milliliter tubes of Lucas 1862. So you can try that brand out. That's the brand we're going to use for swatching. And on the show, I will use these two colors so we can play along together if you've got a white and a black that can work with it. Um, so make sure to sign up. They're going to put the link for that. But in case you missed that at the beginning of the show, now you know. Rainbow, star, um, music. Deb is wondering what oil you recommend adding if you're painting outside. To do what, Deb? As far as I guess drying time goes, if you're painting plain air, maybe. If you're painting plain like air, you're or... you're unless you're using water mixable oils, and you're in very direct sun and you're thinning them down too far, your painting should still be in you know unless it's like 110 degrees in Arizona, you know in July. I I would think that you would um still it would still be kind of wet enough. I don't know if she's wanting something that's gonna dry faster, maybe. It's learning different painting techniques to keep layering, I mean, when you're outside. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, when you're doing plein air painting, I think it's actually, other than thinning the paste slightly, it's actually more um, helpful to just paint straight out of the tube um, and not have a whole lot of, um, of additives and things because that's A, kind of messy, B, not having to bring solvent along, but... Um, you know, look at what your paints are, are made from for your drying oils and work with that. Um, Michelle is wondering the best way to deal with oily rags. That's a good question. We did a safety episode, Michelle, um, about oily rags. And we talked about flashpoint of, um, that's why there's things like um, the terpenoid light has a much higher flashpoint. Turpentines and mineral spirits and things like that do have flashpoints and can spontaneously combust. Mineral spirits has become the thing that most people use instead of turpentines uh, because it's a lower flashpoint. But you can have a bucket of oily rags in, you know, the house and humidity and things like that can actually make something spark. So it's really good to store those outside away from the house if you have even a detached garage or something like that or just a metal uh, pail that you can put uh, water and maybe some sand in the bottom of uh, that has a lid that will lock down because then you're not gonna have that issue. That's obviously not something you want in your studio with a bunch of mess. Um, there's also those fireproof uh, canisters that they use in like machine shops and stuff like that, which I have been looking at because I've been thinking about buying one for myself, but they um, are, they're priced like they're safe. We'll just say that. So, I mean, that's something where if you need to store something inside, that's um, a good option. But, you know, um, 
that's definitely something to think about and we did go over all that in that safety episode. Karen was asking what about quick dry sprays? <sighs> um, Karen, there are those quick dry sprays. But let's let's consider that what you're doing is making it dry to the touch, right? So if a surface area is going to dry first and then you've got areas under and create a film, right? And this is the problem with using multiple oils and pigments that dry really slow and fast with multiple oils. You get that nice skin over the top that feels dry to the touch, which that quick dry spray will give you. You've got this stuff underneath that's percolating, right? Now you might be lucky and you're painting on something like cotton canvas that's very porous, that maybe only has a couple, two or three coats of gesso that are not like super thick. They're just the factory prime stuff, so it's a little breathable through the back. You may ha have the ability to have that off gas out the back and you may be lucky and it's not gonna cause cracking on the top. You have a panel back there. Um, where's that gonna go? This is, this is unstable, this is wet. I, I've got the panel in the, behind it, and then I've got this skin over the top. What is going to happen? It's going to probably crack. Okay, it can also do things like cause, like fissures, like crazing happens with acrylics, with pouring. If it doesn't actually cause cracking, it can cause these weird textured fissures everywhere. Um, it can over time cause that little kind of what looks like, you know, how the, the potters do the Raku firing, where it's got those beautiful little kind of crickety cracks everywhere just in the finish. Okay, that's the same type of thing that can happen with paintings when you don't have them oxidize and dry properly, when you're not careful about layers. Okay, so although it seems like a good thing and, oh, I just finished this last night and... I, you know, it's Wednesday and I'm doing a plein air show, you know, in a booth Saturday. If I spray this on, it'll be dry to the touch. What's well, going to happen when you sell it to somebody, right? I've done paintings for here that were under the gun, that were less than a 48 hour turnaround, that were oils that I knew going in doing, it was a, a person holding a palette. It used to be on one of the old catalogs with really light colors, a lot of titanium white behind it, and then the paint on top of the palette dried really fast. The paint underneath dried really slow. Anybody want to take a guess what that painting looks like now? It was done for photography, just like if you do an illustration work, can you use fluorescence? Because you can, right? Because it's just for taking the picture. That happened to the painting, which kills me because it was the most beautiful hands I'd ever done on a painting ever. Does that matter now? No. Okay. So think about those types of things. What are you willing to sacrifice to have a temporary gold mat? Maybe, you know, so yeah, I, I, I would personally stay away from that, but that's again, everybody's own choice. Do you have any other? No, but we're out of time, but if you okay. want to tell them that they can leave all their questions, anything we didn't get to, you can go back and check in the comments and you yes. can go back and answer them. So. Not, not in the chat comments on YouTube, but if you leave posted comments on mm -hmm. YouTube, I can see those because I can't answer a chat after the fact, okay? So if you're watching on YouTube, leave comments in the actual comments after the video and I can get to those. Um, and then in Facebook as well, just, just tag me in there and it will alert me and I will, I mean, I'll try to go back through them anyway, but a lot of these episodes again, are episode or things that we've talked about are in episodes where we've taken a full hour to actually address these. I think the pigment episode was like maybe an hour and 45 minutes, yeah, it was a while. but it was exciting. It was a really good episode. Um, and it seemed like everybody that watched it just loved that episode. So, uh, again, go to the Jerry's Live Facebook group, and tomorrow by noon, I will post a list of the 10 things that we talked about and all the episodes that uh, have to do with those that we've already done. So you'll have that, and I'll put the links in with it so you guys will have that for a resource, okay?
Um, don't forget to tell them to tag it JL138. That way we can find yeah. everything. Okay. Yes. Tag JL138. And any if you if you talk in the group about this or have questions, and that's the other place that you can post questions is in the Jerry's Live group and tag me. And then um, I will know and I will see it. I try to check it. I only get a chance sometimes to check it three or four times a week, but I, I try to see what everybody's up to. All right, well, hopefully this has been educational. Don't feel like I'm pointing any fingers at you for, for things that you do did wrong or you've done wrong or you thought you would have done this if we hadn't talked to you about it first because we've all been there and we've all done that. So hopefully it's just helped you, given you some ideas of what to do and what not to do to help you become a better painter. Okay, guys?